Hey, what's going on? It's Mr. Salmingo. I am here in the chemistry lab because uh, I don't have my office. And also, we're learning about biochemistry today. Uh, judging by your poll on Schoology, you said this is the one that you wanted to cover the most. So I'm going to go very, very quickly slash not so quickly about chemistry. And then the second part, we're combining two units here. We're talking about cells as well. So start off with biochemistry. First of all, in biochemistry, um, I want you to remember an acronym here, C-H-N-O-P-S, or CHNOPS. Uh, CHNOPS is basically a nice acronym for all the elements, or everything is made up of these six elements. So 96% of the human body is made up of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. And the rest are, um, you can, as you see on this table, the rest are right here. But again, 96% of the... 96% of our body is made up of these four elements, and the majority of almost everything living is made up of chinops. Um, and then we talked about an atom, so a review from chemistry, what an atom is. Atom is the smallest unit of matter. It's made up of three parts, neutron, proton, electron. You should say a neutron has no charge, a proton has a positive charge, and an electron has a negative charge. You should know that the, the neutrons and the protons, as you can see in this picture, are in the middle, and in the nucleus, and the electrons are on the outside. Uh, here on this table, it tells you about the mass. You should know neutrons and protons, the weight is one to one, and electrons have basically negligible mass. Then we talked about bonds. There are three particular bonds we had talked about, all very important to life, as you can see, covalent, ionic, and hydrogen. Covalent are stronger bonds. If you remember, we talked about covalent. Covalent is the sharing of an electron. So when two atoms share this electron, the bond is very strong. And this is what forms most of the cell's molecules. Ionic bonds, in, in a, ionic bonds instead, instead of sharing an electron, what happens is that they give an electron. So one takes one and one gives one. This results in a weaker bond since they're not sharing anything. They're just giving an electron. Um, and that's ionic bonds. Then there's hydrogen bonds. As you know, hydrogen bonds are, uh, exist in water. Uh, it's, it's a result of the polarity of water. Remember, water is polar, meaning it has a positive end and a negative end. So this hydrogen bond exists because of the, the polar, the attraction of positive to negative. So this one's even weaker than ionic bonds. And all these types of bonds, they're made and broken by chemical reactions. Ionic bonds are stronger than covalent bonds, and H2O is not an ionic bond. It's a covalent bond. But, but no, ionic is weak, weaker than covalent. No. Are you serious? Yes. I don't think so. So the last weakest, the, le the weakest bond is van der, Waal, uh, van der Waals. These are slight fleeting attractions between atoms, molecules um, that are close together. Close together. So again, it's the weakest bond. So think of Again, this examples I show here, they're gecko toe hairs or wall surface. They're very, very, very weak bonds, and they're called van der Waals. Then we talked about the special properties of water. So there's a whole chapter we did on water. Um, again, <laughs> again, in water, we have hydrogen bonds. For, I was talking about positive and negative polarity in water molecules. And here you can picture, you can visualize what a hydrogen bond is, the positive charge of hydrogen is slightly attracted to the negative charge of the oxygen atom of another H2O molecule. It can form up to four bonds, as you can see in this picture. Here are the, here's a nice quick table of all the other properties of water. Um, again, going through it very quickly. First of all, water is cohesive. Cohesive is good because it basically cohes... Cohesive means it sticks to itself. So here you see like to like, so it sticks to itself. Adhesion, you see unlike, unlike, it makes it stick to other things. So um, it sticks, uh, we talked about how, um, I believe it was some sort of bug that was walking across water. It's, uh, water can stick to other things as well. Surface tension, meaning it's difficult to stretch or it's difficult to break the surface of water. Uh, if you remember the lab that we did with the penny, if you remember we did the water drops onto a penny and it took forever for that bubble to burst, I guess you'd say. It's because of the surface tension of water. Um, it has specific heat, it evaporates, and it's a, a, use of a universal uh, solvent, which we'll talk about in this next slide. Um, they call it the solvent of life. So it dissolves. Um, it's a universal solvent. 
the reason why it is like that is because it's polar. So it has a positive side and a negative side. We talked about how two different vocabulary words. We talked about hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydrophilic means it has an affinity for water. It is polar. Some examples are cellulose, sugar, salt. Um, hydrophobic means it fears water, so it, it repels. It's nonpolar. And the examples we talked about are oils and lipids, or specifically the phospholipids of a cell membrane. Um, the, the heads of a phospholipid are hydrophobic, and the tails are hydrophilic. After that, we moved on a brief discussion about acids and bases. Acids are those that have more, uh, they have more H plus, I there's solutions that have more H plus ions, and they have a pH that's less than 7. Bases have more OH minus, and those are pH levels that are greater than 7. So here's an example. We talked, we showed you this table before of how the pH scale looks like. You need to know what are examples of some of the pH, uh, some of the acids and some of the bases, and also where they fall on the pH scale. Uh, this one we skipped over. Uh, we'll talk about this more in class. I know Mr. Shi knows more about this than I do, but we're talking about the different functional groups. But from there, we talked about the four types of macromolecules. Uh, in terms of the order of macromolecules, in terms of smallest to biggest, we go from monomers, and a whole bunch of monomers make up a polymer, and a whole bunch of polymers make up a macromolecule. For example, a monomer is an amino acid. A whole bunch of amino acids, if you chain them up, they make a peptide. A whole bunch of chains of peptides is a polypeptide. And when it folds and it links and all that stuff, a whole bunch of these polypeptides make up a protein. Again, we're going in order from smallest to largest. Uh, the way that these, these monomers and polymers are created and broken down, um, we have dehydration and hydrolysis. Dehydration is, um, I don't remember this lab that we did in class, we pasted or taped a lot of these papers together, and then we taped like these water drops. Um, that's how you make polymers. So this one says A plus B yields AB. So you to connect these two, you basically um, create a water molecule, and it like kind of sticks together and it makes this polymer. To break down a polymer is the reverse. You add water, and you take a big polymer, and it splits it up into the monomers. So again, to go through real quick the, the, four, the four macromolecules, the first one we talked about was carbs. The reason why we care about them is they provide energy. The smallest carbs are sugars or glucose. The order in which they go in, the monomer is a monosaccharide. Two monosaccharides is a disaccharide, and then a the whole bunch of disaccharides is a polysaccharide. So you can see what they're here. Um, polysaccharides, again, they use for energy, so you could store them as energy, like starch or glycogen. Or for plants, they use it for uh, structure. So plants have cellulose, that's made up of carbohydrates. And arthropods, I showed you a picture of this, like the exoskeleton of some, um, some insects, is also a polysaccharide. The second one, we talked about lipids. A lot of you associated lipids with fatty, oily stuff, which is true. But there's three types of lipids. Ones are fats that store a whole bunch of energy. We drew a picture and also pasted together a picture of saturated, unsaturated, and polyunsaturated fats. We also talked about steroids, such as cholesterol and other hormones. And then the third lipid we talked about are phospholipids. So again, here's a picture of a phospholipid. It has a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail. And again, it's a bilayer that makes up our cell membrane. So that's why lipids are very important. Um, number three, the third macromolecule we talked about were proteins. Mr. Shu gave you this presentation about a couple months ago. We talked about the four levels. Remember, we talked about beads, like beads of a rosary. The primary structure is amino acids um, that are joined together by peptide bonds. The secondary, if you remember, it gains a 3D shape by like foil, uh, folding and coiling by hydrogen bonds. And you get, as you see in this picture, you get either a alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. The tertiary protein structure is a, um, the bonding between the side chains. So you have a picture here of a tertiary protein. And essentially, like they kind of fold more upon themselves. And you get these side chains that stick together. And the last level of protein structure is quaternary, where two or more of these polypeptides bond together. So that's where you get this three-dimensional shape that you, she that you see here. <laughs> uh, and a lot of the videos and a lot of the pictures we talked about, remember proteins are always 
um, colored or yeah, they're always illustrated as purple. So that's what this is what they are trying to illustrate for you. Uh, I guess in zoomed in form, here's the primary structure, a whole bunch of beads that are chained together. Secondary, we have either a beta pleated sheet like here or an alpha helix like here. When these all fold upon each other, you get a tertiary structure like so. And then when you have multiple of these tertiary structures, you have a quaternary structure. And this is a protein right here. And the last, oh, sorry. And then the structure and function are set very, very, very sensitive to the conditions. So if the pH or the temperature is not perfect, a protein denatures or basically unfolds or falls apart compared to what you just created. So if you have, if it's too acidic or it's too basic or the temperature is too high or too low, a protein like this right here can denature like this right here. And the last one, for some reason, the people, the one, the macromolecule that people forget are nucleic acids. Nucleic acids, they store information. The monomer of a nucleic acid is a nucleotide. There's only two nucleic acids. There's DNA, which is a double helix, and has a sugar of deoxyribose, and RNA, which is a single strand, and it doesn't have T, it has U instead. Again, all this is review. Hopefully you remember it uh, months after we taught it to you. Then, um, again, I'm cutting this in half. So that first part was biochemistry. Everything I taught in that PowerPoint is everything you need to know about the chemistry uh, in biology. Um, the last part, sorry about that. And then, so that first half was about biochemistry. And the second half is a very brief review about cells and everything you need to know about cells for the exam. We started with two types of telescopes. You remember we talked about light, um, light microscopes and electrons. Light, uh, what, how it works is that a visible light passes through the specimen. It can be magnified up to a thousand times. It can be alive and moving, and it's in color. Electrons, they're stronger. They can magnify up to a thousand times because they focus a beam of electrons through the specimen. But it has to be non-living, has to be in a vacuum, and it's only in black and white. So you can tell which microscopes you could use to observe. We talked about the difference between prokaryote and eukaryotes. To make a long story short, prokaryotes do not have a nucleus, and eukaryotes do have a nucleus. Um, they tend to be um, tend to have no other organelles for ribosomes. Eukaryotes do have organelles. We have eukaryotic cells, and bacteria tends to be prokaryotic. That's the difference. And then, lastly, we go over all the organelles of a cell. This should be like so easy for you because you learned it in bio. Some of you learned it for the cathlon, and now you're learning you learned in AP Bio, and now here we go again. Um, here are pictures of both of them. We can go over them very quickly. Um, this one we went over very briefly in class also. We talked about how cells have to maintain a large... Hold on one second. Sorry about that. So what we were saying is that cells, the reason why they're small is that they have to maintain a large surface area to volume ratio. Because if you have a large surface area to volume ratio, we can increase the rates of how things get in and out of a cell from the environment. So take, for example, this cube versus this cube. This cube only has basically the surface area to, um, to take in, let's just say, oxygen or to take in some sort of nutrients. But if I have all this surface area, for example, like why the intestines, there's so many folds in our intestines, is because now I could basically increase the rate in which I want to expel stuff, and I don't want carbon dioxide, and take in stuff like oxygen. So you just need to know that cells have to have a very, very large surface area to volume ratio, or that's why intestines and stuff like that, there's, there's, there's lots of folds. Um, just really briefly, I'm, again, I'm going to go through this real quick. Here are the parts of a cell. You know the nucleus has uh, the genetic information. ER is like a transport system for the proteins that are made. And then this center here, ribosome, looks like this. Remember, the ribosome's its main purpose is to make proteins. We talked about... All right, sorry about that again. So we talked about ER, remember, being the transportation um, for proteins that are made by the ribosomes. They are packaged and shipped out of the cell by the Golgi apparatus. Another organelle is the lysosome. It cleans the cell by eating dead or decaying damaged organelles inside the cell. And then the vacuole, it's really large in plant cells, but it's, it stores stuff. Um, I know for plants, it stores a lot of the sugars that are made. But think of it as a, this one says large membrane bounded vesicle. So think of it as like the refrigerator. Think about a place where they store energy for later. 
We talked about mitochondria, you know, that's the powerhouse, you know, that's where respiration happens. You know, chloroplast, it's green, it's, it's where plants, um, it's where plants make their energy, it's where part of photosynthesis takes place. Um, and that's that. Uh, we talked about the cytoskeleton, again, Mr. Shu talked about the cytoskeleton with you all. Um, the parts of the cytoskeleton, just think of it as a fancy word for the skeleton for the cell. So remember, it goes from microtubules to microfilaments to intermediate filaments. Here are pictures of the three. Again, we went over this, so we're just going to go very quickly. Um, then we talked about between cells, what are the intercellular junctions? So between cells, what sort of connects them? There are tight junctions, so this is right, it's, you can see this right here. This prevents the cell from leaking. Um, there is a desmosome, which is right here and right here. It's like an anchor, so like they stick literally things inside the other cell so that they're anchored to the other one. And then there's a gap junction. So this is, it sounds like it's a gap, um, as you can see here, kind of like pipes and allows things to pass. So there's either a tight junction, a desmosome, or a gap junction. We did the pasta and cereal project for this one. Here's the parts of a cell membrane. You should remember this. Uh, the purple are the proteins. We have cholesterol here built into the membrane. Here's my phospholipids. On the inside, I have the cytoskeleton. And then on the outside, I have these green tails, so to speak. These are like the name tags of a cell. So they either can be glycolipids because they're attached to a lipid, or they're glycoproteins because the tag is attached to a, these purple proteins. There are six types of proteins that can be in the membrane. So in this picture, you saw a you saw these purple things. There's six different types of these purple things that you can have. There's one for transport. There's one to um, basically create and build stuff that, for enzymes. Um, there's ones that take in signals. There's ones that connect cells. There's a way for it to recognize cell to cell. Or it can attach to the cytoskeleton or the extracellular matrix. So six types of proteins you need to know. Or basically six, uh, six jobs that a protein can have. We talked very br briefly about passive and active transport. Passive, you're going from high to low concentrations, like pushing a bowling ball down a hill. It requires little to no energy because it wants to go down that concentration gradient. Active transport, you're going from low to high concentration, so you need energy. It's like pushing a boulder up a hill. We talked about different types of solutions, hypotonic, isotonic, and hypertonic. Isotonic, the concentration is the same on the on the uh, inside and the outside of the cell. Hypotonic, uh, the low concentrations on the outside, so all the stuff on the inside of the cell, they want to rush out. So that's why this sort of explodes. It's called lysed. And then hypotonic, everything... Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Lysed, meaning everything wants to go in. So this is hypotonic. So see how the water, this arrow here, goes into the cell and it bursts because there's so many things inside of it. The reverse is hypertonic, where everything wants to leave, and here it says it's shriveled. So here's an example of things going through a membrane in passive and active transport. So things can just go right through the membrane, that's diffusion, that's passive. Or they could be facilitated diffusion, think of this as like a bridge where these can cross over, and that's also passive transport. But active transport is things that aren't allowed to come into the cell, but I have to use energy to basically like push them inside. Um, Mr. Shu also talked about exocytosis and endocytosis, oh, exocytosis and endocytosis, the transport of large molecules. There's phagocytosis, so this is cell eating, and pinocytosis, which was cell drinking. And then we also talked about another part of endocytosis, which is receptor-mediated endocytosis, and this is very specific. Um, here is a picture right here where things that are so here's cell eating. Okay. So the cell eats this food vacuole. And this is cell drinking, where it takes in a fluid. And this one, again, it's a very specific vesicle, a very specific bubble, like a very specific boat, where only certain things are allowed to go in. And that's it. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. Hopefully it's a good review for you. Um, and I'll see you all next time. Take care.